morning. Good morning. Good morning. Leave it to Ron Howard to make you feel sorry for the Grinch. <laughs> How are you guys this morning? Yeah. Everybody doing okay? I'm going to bring the lights up. Okay. So today, um, I don't know if you've ever had those moments in your life, or if you can remember a time, maybe the, hopefully your whole class didn't laugh at you, but a time in your life where you felt worthless, or you felt like you had no value. Today we're going to look at the part of the Christmas story where they talk about the shepherds. I'm probably going to share some things that maybe you never knew. Um, at the same time, the most important thing about the Christmas story is the idea that you didn't go to God. He came to you. He values you so much that he came to us. That's, that's the, by the way, that's the difference between Christianity and any other uh, uh, faith religion is that we couldn't earn our way to God. There's, you can't do enough good things. It's not about a list of things that you do. And, and I would love to lie to you and tell you that coming to church gives you extra credit, but it's by God's grace. I mean, I like it when you come, and it's good for you, and there's all kinds of reasons why fellowship is excellent for you, but you don't get more into heaven because you came to church. There's going to be people who come Christmas who haven't been all year, and they'll get in before we do. I mean, it's amazing. So that's how good God is. So let me show you something. In my wallet here, this was, by the way, this was super, super crisp last night. It's not quite as crisp. Do you remember, I had a memory this morning, do you remember going to the arcade and you had to do the dollar and you learned how to, anybody ever do that? Have to do the dollar thing with the, okay. So I straightened it out a little bit by doing that. But So this is, if you can't see in the back, this is a hundred dollar bill, okay? So how many of you would like this hundred dollar bill? Raise your hands, I'd like the hundred dollar bill. Just like last night, some of you did not raise your hands and I'm not sure why because you never, the pastor might just hand somebody a hundred dollar bill today. No. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> so this is a hundred dollar bill. Now, let, let me show you something. What if I crumpled up this hundred dollar bill? How many of you would still like the hundred dollar bill? You'd be glad in this form? Wait a second, wait a second. Yep, still think Anybody that. still think this is, yeah. right? No, but, you're a dumb dollar, hundred dollar bill. You're the worst hundred dollar bill ever. The ugliest hundred dollar bill I've ever seen. I can't believe you. How dare you? You're the ugly, dumb. See, here's the thing. No matter what I do to this hundred dollar bill, by the way, even if I tear it in half, as long as one half's a little bigger, it's still got the same value. So let me give you the principle for you. See, God values you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. To God, you are priceless, worth much more than this. But some of you, because somebody told you you were ugly, or you were dumb, or you were worthless, or you were cursed, you feel that way about yourself, and you don't feel valuable. And so let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. No matter what someone told you, you may have had, in your childhood, you may have had a coach, a parent, Somebody who told you, or in their actions, convinced you that they were worthless. Maybe you had a parent that, that left home. Maybe you had a parent that abused you. Maybe you had an in-law that abused you or hurt you. And so you have received this idea that you don't have value because of what somebody did to you. But no matter what somebody told you or did to you, no matter what you tell yourself, some of you before you came here looked in the mirror and said, I'm ugly. Stop it. Quit doing that. You are God's gift. No matter how you look, no, no matter how you feel like you're not, listen, God has gifted you. He, he has given you talents and gifts. It, he thinks you're beautiful. Quit telling yourself you're ugly. Quit telling other people you're ugly. Quit telling other people you're dumb. Quit, quit going out of your way to show people that you don't have value. No matter what someone told you, no matter what you tell yourself, and here it even is true, no matter how you feel. Because I don't know about you, but some days I wake up and I feel great, and other days I wake up and I feel a little grumpy. By the way, you ever wake up irritated and you have no idea why? Anybody ever do that? Yeah. I had a wife tell me, you know, some days I wake up grumpy and sometimes I let him sleep. <laughs>
matter what somebody told you, no matter what you tell yourself, no matter how you feel, you are priceless to God. And the real Christmas story is not as concerned about wise men or shepherds. It's all about the fact that God gave everything for you. And Christmas is the beginning of that journey for us. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why we celebrate Jesus' birth. We're not so worried about the exact date. Did you know that? But the idea is that we celebrate what God's done for us. So here's what we're going to talk about today. How do the shepherds show us our values? So let me tell you a couple things about shepherds just so you'll understand this. In the Mishnah, which is the, I probably pronounced that totally wrong, uh, which is Judaism's written record of oral law, this is what they said about shepherds during the time of Jesus. By the way, by the way, just a side note, Paul's teacher to this day, Gamaliel, if you talk to a rabbi, he will say, oh, Gamaliel, he is the end of the oral law. He was the, the he's considered like the father of oral tradition. So he was one, Paul's uh, guy, uh, the guy who taught Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, was one of the guys who said this. It describes shepherds as incompetent. Another one says that no one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. Imagine if this is you. You're not even worthy of rescue. You're not allowed to testify in court because you're considered so dishonest your testimony wouldn't count. That's what people thought about shepherds. They could not uh, be judges. They couldn't be admitted to court. And ready for this? They weren't even allowed in the temple until they were purified or clean. So it would be like you showed up for church today, and Brian, who didn't ask, what a nice guy, stood out front and said, oh, I'm sorry. You can't come in here. What, what's your job? And you told him your job. He said, huh, I'm sorry. You can't come in here. you got to take off for work a couple of weeks before you can ever come in here. What? How does that make you feel about yourself? See, because here's the deal. They, they even believe that if you tried to buy something from a shepherd, it was most likely stolen. During the time of Jesus, even if, even if these were temple shepherds, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, even if these were temple shepherds who were raising Passover sheep, they still were the lowest of the temple. They were still the, the downcast. And here's the awesome part about God. When we look at the story of the shepherds as Luke shares with us, we realize that God could care less what you think about yourself. God could care less. I'm talking about if you're negative about yourself. God could care less what other people think about you. He could care less how you feel you fit in in the caste system, whether you think you're awesome or whether, because he loves you just like you are. He is not a respecter of persons. So even if you have bad self-esteem, he absolutely loves you. You just haven't figured it out yet. Even if you're overconfident and arrogant, guess what? He loves you anyway, even in your arrogance. By the way, in, in, during the time of Jesus, rabbis used to ask about Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. They would ask, how can God even call himself a shepherd? And they had debates about how somebody, why God would even do that. I mean, that's how low they thought of shepherds. And yet, the announcement is made not to kings, not to royalty, not to the temple, but to shepherds just doing their job, just out watching sheep. So we're going to look at a story you've always looked at, and I'm going to point out a couple things that maybe you've never heard. Number one, all-powerful God loves you like a shepherd. Bethlehem was a neat place. Bethlehem is the place that Rachel died. Remember, Rachel had two kids. One you, you're familiar with. His name was Joseph. Remember Joseph? And he had a brother named Ben, Benjamin. And you remember when Benjamin came and finally visited Joseph after all those years and all the brothers came around? Remember, Joseph gave him extra on his platter because he was, they were stepbrothers and they were brothers. See, it started way back. So they actually had a tomb there, and they still have a tomb to this day for Rachel, but David was also born there. And so you have this whole line, and that's why Joseph and it had to go back uh, with Mary uh, uh, to, to pay taxes, which is always a good start. We talked about that last week. All right. In Isaiah 40, God says this. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. So you see this awesome God. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. And then it says this. Listen. 
He tends his flock like a, what's the word? Shepherd. A shepherd. By the way, shepherd, do you know what that word is? Pastor. Did you know it's the same word? You should be scared now. All right, anyway. <laughs> he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He rudely, angrily, no, he gently leads those that have young. So it's not the picture of God in heaven. This is Old Testament. You know, you think of Old Testament like two different gods or something? No. No, he's not trying to, he's not trying to wipe people out. He's not, he's not trying to hit you with a baseball bat. What's he doing? He's trying to help you. Now, he allows us to have the consequences of our behavior. If you do something dumb, you are allowed to do something dumb today. Did you know that? Me too. It's exciting. But at the same time, what does he do? He gently leads us. So let me ask you this question. When was the last time you thought of God? As a good shepherd. When was the last time you just let that sink in? That when God was trying to give us an idea, Old Testament idea of who he was, he didn't talk about his justice. He didn't, didn't just talk about his might. And by the way, this happened with Moses too. He didn't just talk about these things. What did he talk about? His mercy, his gentleness, his love for us. Number two, the Savior came for you. I love this scene. You all know the story of the angels getting ready to appear, but, but I just want to make it real to you for a minute, okay? Years ago, I heard a noise in the backyard. I had let my dog out to go to the bathroom, and I heard a noise in the backyard. So I opened the door, and the, the light would not work for the backyard. You ever had that happen? And it's dark. It's dark, and I can hear the dog growling, and I'm like, what is going on? And I go out, and the dog has got something in his mouth, and he's running around the backyard, running around the backyard, running around the backyard, and then he would set it down and back away. And then all of a sudden, he'd run at it again, and I'm like, what is going on? So, so I got, all I had was a small pool net for a kiddie pool. Because <laughs> I thought, I gotta keep the dog. He had gotten a possum. Oh. And what was happening is he would carry it around, he would think it was dead, he'd set it down, and he'd back up, and then you know what possums do, right? They were playing dead. Oh yeah. Possum would get up, my dog would go, and take him again, run around the yard, run around the yard, run around the yard. Can I tell you, I was a little freaked out, so I'm holding the net between the dog and the possum, trying to go, go, you would listen to me. Now, imagine you're a shepherd in a field. There are always a chance that, by the way, I could not get the dog away from the possum without a little help. Imagine you're a shepherd in a field where lions might come in and get one of your sheep. I couldn't get a possum out of my Imagine a lion. That's your job. You're watching these sheep. You're peering into the dark. By the way, I don't know if you've ever been outside in Florida. In Miami, we had these all the time. When you brush up against a tree or you're walking outside your house and all of a sudden the tree frog lands on your head. Oh, yeah. By the way, if you want to see me yell like the girl, <laughs> I can't tell you the number of times in South Florida, you, know, you close the front door, you're like, okay, I'm great. Ah! Like tree frog with a little sticky. How many of you have had the tree frog on the head? Okay. I'm somewhere on your okay. So imagine this, you're in a field, you're looking for lions or tigers or bears. Thank you. Let's try that again. You're in a field, you're looking for lions and tigers or bears. Oh, my. Much better. And you're squinting, and then all of a sudden, the Bible says, there's angels. Okay, so let's read it. Here it is. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. We're going to come back to this. This is really cool. Keeping watch over their flock at night. By the way, this word for over may literally mean watching over. We're going to talk about why that's important in a minute. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Why? Because they didn't fade in. Apparently, they don't have a dimmer switch for angels. They just, boom, come back into that. Thing. Boom. Right? If you understood that, you watch way too much TV. You're An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. So you can imagine, this is one angel. One angel appears. Boom, they're freaked out. They are freaked out. By the way, the angels always say the same thing. There's only one time in the Bible they didn't say this. Here's what the angel said. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Only time in the Bible that doesn't happen is a guy in the Old Testament named Balaam, who the angel didn't like. He said, I was going to 
kill you and leave your donkey. That's the first Shrek story, Old Testament, Google it later. All right, so anyway, so, so the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. By the way, that's really good news. When an angel appears suddenly and is gigantic, it can wipe you out. And by the way, angels are like God's mafia, if you didn't know this. They wipe people out, they protect people. They show up and they say, oh, on God's side, not your side. You know, all this kind of stuff. I just imagine that an angel showing up would be terrifying. So here's shepherds peering in the dark. Boom, they're right there. And then it says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. That will bring great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been, look at this, born to you. I'm just a shepherd. Even, even if these were temple shepherds, some people think that these were actually temple shepherds that were raising, and, and it's probably true because Around Bethlehem is where they raise the Passover sheep. Most other sheep were raised in the woods. But the sheep for Passover, so they had to have 700 and, uh, uh, they did daily sacrifices at the time. By the way, if you try to do a sacrifice in Jerusalem now, they will arrest you. They arrested people just in the last couple of years trying to do a sacrifice. I wonder what changed. Oh, maybe the Messiah already came. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, in Micah 4, 8, there's actually a prophecy about this tower called the Sheep Tower. And the sheep tower is, is where Jesus was to be born, in this area. So some people think that Jesus may have actually been born right at the sheep tower. Because here's what would happen. When a sheep was born for Passover, and, and by the way, remember twice a day, and then also about 25,000 a year during Passover itself that they would raise, and then people would basically uh, uh, give it a sacrifice and eat. By the way, not all sacrifices are burnt offerings. I don't know if you knew that. There are burnt offerings, but most offerings, you actually ate the food. It would be like barbecuing. So you offered the fat to the Lord, and then guess what? The priest got part, and then, and then you got to take it home and eat. I don't know if you knew that, so there's a little land yet for you. So, so you can imagine all the sheep outside of Bethlehem, and by the way, just so you know, they would have been out there in December. Every once in a while somebody says, well, they wouldn't have been in the field in December. Yeah, when you had to raise that many sheep for Passover around April... They had to be under, or right around a year old or under, but the sheep had to be spotless. So as soon as they were born, they would wrap them in swaddling clothes to keep them from thrashing around, and then they would wash them in a basin that they called a manger. There's two thoughts about the swaddling clothes, by the way. One is that it was the sheep wrap. The other one was when you were, if you were Jewish and you traveled, you actually had to wear swaddling cloths around you because you had to be buried within a day. So if you were traveling, you would wear your own burial clothes all the time, just in case. So we don't know which one Jesus was wrapped in, but it says, the Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. If these were the shepherds that raised the Passover sheep, that's just what they had been waiting for. The Messiah. So I want you to take just a moment before you go any further. Just think of the idea that a Savior is not born to kings, not born to religious people, not born to only people who are good enough, but a Savior has been born to you, to rescue you. God doesn't look at Billy Graham. Some of you don't know who that is, by the way. I found out anybody under 30 is like, Billy who? He doesn't look at Billy Graham and say he's more spiritual. He's born to you. And so Christmas is not just about religious people or people who do good things or whatever you think it might be about. It's about a Savior that came to rescue all of us. Spurgeon says this, when the Lord has come, become your peace. Remember, there's another thing, goodwill towards men. Do not try to keep Christmas without goodwill towards men. Because here's what I know. Once you realize what God's done for you and that you have value, it makes it a lot easier to love grumpy people. Because they don't decide your value anymore. No more does that in-law or that relative or that parent of yours get to decide what you're worth. So you can love them without fearing that they will take your value away. Number three. 
Almighty God gave you his favor. I love this. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths. I kind of got ahead of myself there. And lying in a manger. I love the next word here. Suddenly. Do you know life's about suddenlies? Whatever's going on in your life now, God can bring a suddenly into your life and change everything in a moment. I imagine that these shepherds, some of them had fights with their spouses before they came to work that day. I imagine some were there leaning on their staffs going, I cannot wait for this shift to be over. <laughs> right? Man, almost Christmas time. I got shopping to do. No, I don't think they were. All right. So, right? Right? I don't think they were on Amazon, but, but they had problems. They had difficulties. They were human. Some of them may have been sick. One of them might have had the flu. We have no idea. They were human. So they would have been in the field with all of their difficulty. And the Bible says, suddenly. I don't know about you, but you need to realize that regardless of what's happening in your life right now, that God can give you a suddenly. Your suddenly might not even take your circumstances away, but it may be that God just gives you his peace in the middle of your circumstances. It could be that you felt like you were nothing and that you didn't matter and people have crumpled you up and crushed you and stood on you and yelled at you and told you were worthless. It could be that even in the middle of all your troubles and your trials, you suddenly realize that God absolutely values you. You have a suddenly. Or you wake up one day and you're like, you know, God, you really do. I don't even know why you love me, but you love me. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts time out. There's only a couple of times this happens in the Bible. Thousands of angels. I mean, one freaked them out. One angel appearing would be like, ah! Thousands. Just imagine the sky filled with angels who then began speaking together with one voice. Praising God and saying, they didn't sing it, it doesn't say singing. I'd love it to be singing, though. It's not anti-singing. It would be awesome if they sang it like the Messiah, you know. Glory to God. Anyway, okay. So, glory to God in the highest heaven. Which, by the way, imagine thousands of angels saying this as you're standing in the field. You're getting this news for the first time. You haven't read this Christmas story over and over again and heard about the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest heaven on earth. Peace on those on whom his favor rests. And the angel had left them and gone into heaven. By the way, they don't fade in, but apparently they fade out. The shepherds said to one another, Hey, I don't, I don't see the hey, I screwed that one. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Everything for these shepherds changed in a moment. God can do that for you. If you're not a Christian, he can do that for you when you give your life to him. If you are a Christian, he can do that for you when you realize that God's not in heaven with a little list going, you better watch out, you better not cry. You better not pat, I'm telling you why. I'm coming. It's not God. God says, give me your list. Just say, God, forgive me. And that suddenly can happen. When you realize how valuable, how much God loves you, it helps you to relate to people. You can feel God's love, so then you can love other people. So I want you to take a moment today to thank God that his favor rests on you. If you're a believer, his favor rests on you. And truthfully, even if you're not, God gave you his favor, whether you receive it or not. His favor rests on you. You are not cursed. If you're one of these people that says, well, I just knew that would happen to me. That's stinking thinking. You've got to quit that mess. You are valuable. You're loved by God. Yes, in this world we will have trouble. Jesus said that. But he also said he's overcome the world. So even in your trouble, you can overcome. Ask God to help you live in awareness of his favor. Number four, God chose to use you to tell others. See, because here's the deal. Once you realize your value, it's easier to tell others. I don't know about you, but I went to Walmart this week. <laughs> Walmart's the only place that people will complain to you when you don't know them. So you can stand in line and people will turn around and go, isn't this ridiculous? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
No, it's Christmas. Did you not notice it's almost Christmas and you and I are here at the store like idiots together? And so are 10 million other people because we forgot some stuff. So it's not really that lady's fault. I'm doing the best I can. I'm sorry. Price check. Right? It's amazing how we will complain to people and nobody feels weird about it, but we won't say, hey, you know, I'm so blessed. I mean, truthfully, think about it. If you were in Walmart and somebody came up to you and said, let me tell you what God's done for me, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> All deserved. Right? Isn't that funny? But if somebody walked up to you and said, can you believe the line? You would just jump right in. Isn't it amazing how we're that way? Once you realize your value, you don't mind sharing with others. So, so the shepherds saw this amazing thing, and even though people didn't trust them, even though they couldn't testify in court, even though you couldn't even buy a goat from a shepherd because they assumed it was stolen, they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Who were the first visitors? The leaves, the shepherds. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. By the way, time out. It doesn't say that anybody did anything. Oh, that's, that's nice, isn't here? That's amazing. Nobody said, where do we go? We'll come visit too. Nope. But Mary, listen to this. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds then returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Listen, when God does a suddenly in your life, all of a sudden you begin to say, you know what, God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for the things that you've done. By the way, if God does a suddenly in your life and you're not grateful and you're not thankful and you continue to whine and complain, When he does it suddenly in your life, you should glorify God, praise God for what he's done. So let me ask you this. Do you tell others what God has done for you? Now, please don't walk up to people in Walmart and go, let me tell you what God has done for me. <laughs> but you know what? It doesn't hurt for you to say, you know, I'm so blessed. I'm so, have you seen my kids? I'm so blessed. When you're at work, I'm so blessed. Because you have a choice what comes out of your mouth. Did you know that? I know you might not think you do. And if what comes out of your mouth all the time is complaining and grumbling, you need a suddenly. If you're whining all the time, yeah, we, you, listen, you're in the wealthiest country in the world. If you're the sickest person in this room, you're more blessed than most people in the world. Number five, Jesus gave all for a relationship with you. See, if you don't feel valuable yet, you know what makes something valuable? What somebody would pay for it. Years ago, a guy went to a garage sale, and, and there was a motorcycle in the corner, and he got this Harley Davidson motorcycle that was in pieces, and he took it home, and he started working on the Harley Davidson. He needed some parts. They called Harley Davidson, and the guy said, okay, I need the model number. Gave the guy the model number, and the guy said, what? He said, uh, tell me the serial number on the thing. What? The guy had bought Elvis's motorcycle for like a thousand bucks. Oh it's worth like millions. You're valuable. Because of what someone would pay. See, if it was my motorcycle, well, first of all, it would be in pieces. But if it was my motorcycle, <laughs> nobody's paying extra for Eric's motorcycle. Can I tell you that? Jesus has written on your heart. He's paid the ultimate price for you. Listen to what it says. I'm the good shepherd, Jesus said. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep, dumb sheep can't even, if they get too full of wolves, you know they can't even stand up straight. If they roll over, they can't even get themselves up. The shepherd has to go over and go. They wander off. They get hurt. And yet Jesus says, I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. That's us, if you're not Jewish. I bring, bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. He's basically saying, because I'm God, this command I receive from my father. Let me ask you this question. You're worth much more than this hundred dollar bill. You are priceless. Have you received the gift that God gave to you at Christmas? And here's the deal. 
If you're not a Christian, that means to say, Jesus, I know I need you. I'm broken. I'm messed up. I'm a failure. I don't do things right. I don't get it right. And I surrender my life to you. I want you to be in charge of my life. But if you're a Christian, you know what that means sometimes? Realizing that you're valuable. Don't receive his gift of grace and then try to earn it. Don't receive his gift of grace and then try to work yourself to God so you forget to have your quiet time one morning. You're like, well, God doesn't love me as much today. He loves you. He wants you to obey, but he loves you right where you're at. Do you take time to listen to his voice? When was the last time in church that you just allowed God during the sermon to maybe use a verse or use something that was said just to speak to your heart? Maybe you're just driving down the road and you thought, it's all about me, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, you realize the other cars aren't trying to kill you, right? You realize I love the people in that car, not as much as me. You let God speak to you. You know one of the ways this time of year I think God speaks to us the most? Is when we're sitting at home and all of a sudden we think of someone we haven't seen. I'm going to check on so-and-so. Chris and I ran into a lady driving through the Walmart parking lot the other day. Walmart. Just waved at her. Hadn't seen her in a while. So I wrote her a note this morning and said, you doing okay? And she said, this is what's going on in my life. I said, we'll come help. God can put those things on your heart if you allow him to speak to you. So allow him to speak to you. No matter what someone told you, no matter what you tell yourself, no matter how you feel, you're priceless to God. Christmas is about God giving all for you. But if you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, we don't do an invitation where people come down the aisle, but I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you've given your life to Christ, but you've never taken that next step of baptism. You can sign up in the back. We're going to have baptism in January. We don't know where you have. We're working on that. But we're going to try to have it out here. But we're going to have baptism. And maybe you want to take that next step. And if you're here today and you need prayer, or maybe God spoke to your heart and you just need to make a new commitment, maybe you feel valueless and you just need to admit to God, God, I want to agree with you about my value to you. Start there. Start there. Let's go to Lord's Prayer today. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for how much you love us. Thank you that the shepherds were first. Lord, you didn't choose the great. You didn't choose the mighty. You didn't choose the wise men. You didn't choose the guys that were carrying gold. You chose the shepherds, the weak, the mistrusted, the hurting. Father, you chose them to come first, and we thank you that you chose us. And so, Father, right now, we just surrender our will to your will. Father, I ask during this Christmas season that instead of us trying to get everything done, instead we would see the best way to love people because you love us. So, Father, thank you for this time today. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their lives to you. I pray if somebody's watching online, that maybe today would be the day that they surrender their lives to you. And Father, I also pray as we take our offering in a minute, that you would bless each dollar given, not just to bless people here, but, Father, to bless people around the world. That my friends who are missionaries in the Philippines, and as they get part of that through many churches, Father, that you would use that to spread your word and your love, just like the shepherds did throughout the world. Thank you for this time today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.